Last week, the world lost Comrade Fidel, didn't they? Fidel Castro died. Now, I feel sorrow for any lost person who dies and stands before God, doesn't know him as father, but as judge, and experiences the wrath of God. I feel sorrow for anyone, and unless he made some decision before he died, we know where he is. There were a lot of platitudes said about Fidel Castro when he died, a lot of famous and infamous, I should say, tweets made about him and what a great man that he was. He was not a great man, was he? He has the blood of tens of thousands of his own people on his hands, and he imprisoned. Conservative estimates say over 100,000 of his people on that imprisoned island of Cuba. There's an antidote that I heard last week about Fidel Castro. I don't know that it's true. Uh, wouldn't surprise me based on what I know of this guy's character. There's a story told that in Cuba, in this little obscure backwater village, that there was this woman who was being abused by a low-level Communist Party official. And this was going on for years. She's being abused by this guy. And she would always say, if Comrade Fidel ever found out about this, he would do something. The guy would just laugh. This went on, as I said, for year after year. And then one day, guess what? He showed up. Comrade Fidel showed up to this obscure backwater village and she went and told him what this low-level Communist Party official had done. And guess what? He did do something. He put her in a political prison for making what he claimed was a false accusation about one of his party men. I bring this story up because we're about to celebrate Christmas and Christmas is all about the incarnation. That word incarnation comes from a Latin word and it means in the flesh. A simple way of saying the incarnation is God showed up. God came, the boss, the leader, the creator showed up among his creation. Was the coming of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, was the coming like that of Fidel Castro? Did he come and just continue in justice? Absolutely not. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, showed up in history, showed up among his creation for a central, pivotal purpose, and that purpose was positive. Jesus came, Jesus took on flesh, Jesus was born to bring salvation, to go to the cross. This morning, as I told you, we're starting a, a new series for Christmas, talking about the hope that we have in Christmas. And this morning, we're thinking about the incarnation. We're thinking about hope in the God who showed up. And this morning, I want to share with you some facts about the way that God did show up at Christmas time. If you brought your Bible, I hope you did, turn back to the Gospel of John. We're in John chapter 1. This is the prologue to the Gospel of John. Uh, scholars and commentators say that, that John was written for an evangelical, uh, evangelistic rather purpose, that he came to, to lead people to Christ. We know that from what is within the book, John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. I shared that earlier. He, came, he wrote these things that people would believe on Christ, believe on his name and have life as a response. But you can go even further than that. And scholars say that, that the gospel of John was written to engage a Greek audience. Folks who were steeped in philosophy. And one of the, the evidences that they give is this prologue. John chapter 1 verses 1 to 18. John uses a certain title to identify Jesus. The, the English word is word. The Greek word is logos. We're going to talk about that word in a, in a moment on further in the sermon. But the Greeks had an idea that there was a logical unifying principle that brought order to the universe. John says, you're right, but it's not an impersonal principle. It's not an impersonal force like Star Wars. It's a person. And he starts to nail it down beginning in verse 14. The Word, this unifying principle that brought order to creation, became flesh. 
and dwelt among us. This morning, we're going to look at this statement that he gives about the incarnation in verses 14 to 18. And we're going to see some wonderful facts about this God who showed up. I want to share these facts with you because some of you here today don't know this God that showed up. You don't know the Savior that came, and so you really don't understand Christmas. It's my hope that after hearing this this morning, if you are lost, that you will embrace Jesus and know salvation. Let's pray together and then we'll dive in. Our Father, we humble ourselves and we come into your presence, Lord. And I pray for us this morning that we would cut through all the fake trappings surrounding Christmas. We get so caught up about presents, family, food, that we forget really what it's all about, what we're supposed to be celebrating, and that is Jesus. That is you coming and coming to bring us salvation. Lord, I pray that this message and the rest of them for the month of December would bring us back to that central purpose of Christmas. And Lord, I ask if there's one here who is lost, who has not embraced Jesus, who has not received the gospel as their own, that today would be their day of salvation. Lord, I pray for myself. I am so inadequate to preach the gospel, Lord. I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough on my own. So Lord, I pray that you would anoint me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, before there can be an outflow of the word, before this message can bless your people, I have to be filled. I have to be anointed, Lord, to be able to do this. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give me that special unction and anointing, that the word would go forth with power, authority, Lord, that it would also go forth with a tone and attitude of love and respect. May you use this message for the exaltation of Jesus, the building up of your church, and the expansion of your kingdom. Hear me now and do so in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to think about the, these sermons that I'm going to do through the month of December, just kind of going back to the basics. I want it to be very simple, very understandable. The incarnation, hope in the God who shows up. That's what the incarnation is about. Now let's probe this passage on the incarnation further and let's learn just some very basic facts about this God who showed up, about the incarnation. First fact we see is that God showed up in the flesh. That's what the incarnation is all about. God showed up in history. God showed up among his creation and he did so in the flesh. And if you will, look at the first part of verse 14. I almost want to take off my shoes as I read this because it's so holy. It's so sacred just to read it. Listen. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. I just want to break that up and talk about it for just a minute and then apply it to us. This short part of verse 14 is a statement that, that God showed up in the flesh. We know that. Let's, let's break it down. That word, word, why does John use that? He's talking about Jesus. Where does he get that from? Does he pull it out of thin air? No, he's got two ideas in mind. One is a Jewish idea. This goes back to Genesis chapter 1. And, uh, how did God create the universe? spoke the power of his word the word is seen as demonstrating God's power and God's revelation what John is saying here is that Jesus embodies the power and revelation of the father he also uses this term to reach a lost Greek audience they're steeped in philosophy they, they had this idea of the logos which was a unifying principle they said it brought order to creation, order into chaos. And John said, you're right, and it's a person. And he took on flesh. He uses this term word to talk about Jesus. And it says the word was made flesh. That idea of flesh is the idea of almost putting on a robe, putting on some clothing. The idea is that God became a man, not man became a God. Did y'all follow that? Did you hear that? The Mormons and other Christian cults they say that Jesus was a man who became God. That's heresy. That's false teaching. The incarnation teaches us, Scripture teaches us that Jesus is God. 
who became a man. He took on flesh, took on that nature, and it says that He dwelt among us. That word dwelt, it literally means to tabernacle, to put up a tent almost. He came among us for a time. He took on flesh. When God showed up, He took on flesh. He became a man. Do you follow that? No. Or do you get it? Why? Of all the manners, all the different ways that God could have come, why come in the flesh? One word, atonement. See, the doctrine of the incarnation is connected with the atonement. The book of Hebrews and other places in the Old Testament says without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. Our sins could not be dealt with without the broken body, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Blood had to be spilt to bring about forgiveness, to bring about restoration, to blot out all of our sins and our transgressions. And it is for that reason in eternity past that God the Father said, I'm going to send my Son into creation. I'm going to send my Son into human history. And when He does, He will come as a man and walk among us. The Apostle Paul put it this way in the book of Colossians chapter 1, verse 21. Speaking about that church at Colossae and, and their, their history, who they were before salvation, listen to what he says. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your body by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. He said you were once alienated from the Father. You were a child of wrath. You were his, his enemy. There was warfare between you. But now the relationship has been restored. You have been reconciled. How? He gives the answer in verse 22. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. How were the lost reconciled to the Father? How were those who were alienated, the enemies of God brought near and restored? The death of Jesus Christ, the broken body, the shed blood. Oh, folks, God has shown up in history and He showed up in the flesh and He did so so that you and I could be saved. Where do you stand right now? Have you seen this truth? Have you seen this wonderful fact that Jesus stepped down from glory? That Jesus, the Word, took on flesh and dwelt among us and He came in order to die and have you embraced Him? is your own. You cannot understand Christmas. You cannot know salvation. You are lost and you are on your way to hell until you understand and believe and accept Christ has come in the flesh and Christ has died for you. So as we talk about the incarnation, as we put it simply, God showed up. We see that He showed up in the flesh. Now let's move on. Let's see another fact in John's prologue here. We see not only did He show up in the flesh, but He showed up with a witness. When God showed up in the flesh, He showed up with a witness. Look at verse 15 of our passage. It says, John bear witness of Him. That phrase, bear witness, it means almost like giving official testimony. He's called upon to testify to a court of inquiry. John bear witness of Him, and He cried, saying, This was He of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now we all know a lot about John the Baptist, don't we? We know that he was a unique man of God. He had a special anointing upon his life. And that anointing, that ministry that was given to him was to be the forerunner, to prepare the way for the Messiah. John the Apostle mentions John the Baptist a lot in chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. But in verse 15, he starts to detail the preaching of John. He starts to say specifically what was the content of John's message. Now, I want to give you the content of John's preaching there in a phrase. I'm going to share it with you in just a second. I'm going to give you another phrase now, though, okay? We say first come, first what? First come, first serve. We say it, you've heard it, you've used it, right? The, the summary of John's preaching is almost like that, but a little bit different. He says about Jesus, first come, first in priority, first in preeminence, 
first come, first in preeminence. Do you hear it there in verse 15? People were coming to him, asking him uh, about Jesus, asking him about himself and his testimony. And he says, I'm not the coming one. I'm not the Messiah. There's one who's preferred before me. There's one who is preeminent because he existed before me. Isn't that a remarkable message that he had? First come, first in preeminence, first in priority. As I was thinking about John's preaching, as I was thinking about his message, the summary of what he taught, of what he preached, I find it very interesting and remarkable because he had the opportunity to claim to be Christ. If you read on in chapter 1, I think it starts in, in verse 19. There was a delegation sent from Jerusalem. This was the religious aristocracy. They wanted to come and they wanted to investigate John's orthodoxy. They wanted to see what, what was he teaching. At that moment, he could have told those bigwigs, I'm the coming one. He could have told them, I am Messiah. I'm the one that you've been looking for. He could have tweaked that message, so to speak. But what did he do? He kept saying the same thing over and over again. First come, first in preeminence, first in priority. There is one who has existed before me. He is preferred before me. Why would John do that? He had this temptation, this great temptation to know fame, to know luxury, to know power if he changed his message, and yet he kept preaching the same thing. First come, first in priority. First come, first in preeminence. Why did he keep doing that? I thought about that last week and this week. And then it hit me. It's real simple why he did that. Because it was the truth. Sounds real simple, doesn't it? Real basic. It was the truth. If he had claimed to be the Messiah himself, that would have been a lie. That would have been dishonest. That would have robbed him of all of his power, of all of his fruitfulness in his ministry. So that's why he kept saying the same thing over and over again. Jesus is the one. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the one who has preeminence. Folks, when God came, he came in the flesh and he came with a witness. This witness was prophesied in Scripture in Malachi and Isaiah. And this witness was truthful. Now you may be saying right now, okay, John the Baptist, witness of the Messiah, the forerunner, the one who prepared the way. But Brother Randy, it's December 4th. It's December 4th, isn't it? 2016. What does that have to do with me? Well, we've got a man who's giving honest, truthful testimony. What he said is real. What that means is that Christ's claims about himself, about his identity, are true. They are real. That puts the ball in your court. How will you respond to the claims of Jesus? How will you respond to this fact that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us? How will you respond to this testimony of John? Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is God incarnate. Jesus is the one who has come to save His people. Will you reject that testimony? Will you reject that witness that God has sent? Or will you embrace Him? And embrace his testimony and say, yes, Jesus is the Lord. Yes, Jesus is God incarnate. And yes, Jesus is my Savior. This fact that God showed up with a witness means that you need to respond. One way or the other, definitively, and say, I will receive Christ. I will be converted. I will believe on him or I will reject him. This walk in the fence line. This not wanting to make a decision for or against has got to end. To not respond is to respond. And it's to respond negatively. I hope, I pray that today you'll receive Christ. Today you'll believe the true testimony of John. So we see the incarnation. It gives us hope because it's saying that God showed up. He showed up in the flesh. He showed up with a witness. Now lastly, I want you to see... He showed up to work. God showed up the incarnation to work. How many of you watch Undercover Boss? 
Not me. Is the show still on? I watch it occasionally. And you've got the boss, right? The big wig. They come and they investigate their company. They don't do a whole lot of work. Do they? they just kind of look around and see what's going on. Makes for good TV though, don't it? Is that what God did in the incarnation? Did he just show up just to, to look around? No. Nah. Showed up for a purpose. He showed up for a mission. There was a work to carry out. That is why Jesus came. His work was, was twofold. And we see that in verses 16 on down to 18. Can I read these verses again? It says this. And of his fullness, talking about Jesus, the living word, incarnate deity, as we just sang about, of his fullness, have we all received in grace for grace. Some of your modern translations will say grace upon grace. Verse 17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. In this statement about the incarnation, John tells us that when God showed up, he showed up to work. He showed up to carry out a mission, a purpose. It was a twofold work that Jesus, the only begotten Son of the Father, did. First, he came to extend grace. That's one of the works that he carried out. He came to extend grace. You see that in verses 16 and 17. I love verse 16. Of the fullness of Christ, the one in whom deity dwells in bodily form, from that fullness we have received grace for grace. Grace on top of grace for Jesus. From Jesus, rather. To understand that, you need to understand what the word grace means. You know what the word grace means? is. It's a Greek word chorus. And it means unmerited favor. It's somebody being good to you when you don't deserve it. And what John is trying to convey about the incarnation, the coming of Jesus in verses 16 and 17, is that we can't save ourselves. We can't keep the law as we should. That's what he's talking about. Verse 17 he says, The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. We can't save ourselves. We can't fix ourselves. We can't make ourselves right with God. And for that reason, God showed up. He showed up in the person of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. And when Jesus came, He came to give grace because He came to save. So you can't earn your salvation. You don't deserve it. You can't ever work hard enough to get it on your own. But Jesus, by His coming and by His death, is willing to give it to us as a free gift, that which we don't deserve. The Apostle Paul put it like this in a very famous couple of verses of Scripture. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Paul writes, For by grace, there's our word, chorus, by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God showed up to extend grace for us to be saved. So I ask you this morning, are you still trying to be good enough? Are you still trying to, to, to work hard enough to be right in God's eyes? Now, work has its place. Doing good things has its place. But you do good deeds, you pursue morality because you are saved. Not in order to be saved. You can't make yourself clean enough, you can't make yourself good enough. What you must do is come to Jesus to believe on Him and receive God's grace. That's what happened at the incarnation. God showed up and He showed up to extend grace. You can be saved today. By the grace of God, you can be right with the Father. Notice something else, though, this work that God did when he, when he showed up. When Jesus showed up, He came to extend grace, but He also came to explain the Father. He came to explain the Father. Look at verse 18 of our passage. It says, no man had seen God at any time. That's because God is spirit. He is invisible. But John goes on and says, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, that, that idea of bosom means that He knows the Father perfectly. 
and intimately. That only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. That word declared in the Greek, it's, it's a Greek word. It's ex omai, ex omai. And it means to explain something and to do it rightly, to do it perfectly. What John is saying about the incarnation, the coming of Jesus, was that when Jesus came, He explained who the Father is. And He did so perfectly. And you may say right now, man, that is some deep theological territory, brother. And it is. It's very deep. I'm treating you like grown-ups, adults this morning. It's very deep stuff. And you may say, okay, I understand now that Jesus revealed the Father to us by His coming. John says it there. Jesus would say it Himself throughout His earthly ministry. I and the Father are one. To see Me is to see the Father. But you may be thinking right now, what application does that have for me? Other than the fact that it's good, truthful information, how does it affect me this morning? Well, let me tell you what many of us do. We're all guilty of it at times and on some levels. Our idea of God is misinformed and based on our prejudices, our opinions, and our presuppositions. We make a God in our own image. That's what we have a tendency to do. What we like personally and don't like, we shape our God into that. You ever heard somebody say, my God wouldn't do fill in the blank. You heard that before? That's called an idol. Did you know that? A God of your own making, a God of your own opinion is an idol. And I wonder how many people in our churches are worshiping not the true God of Scripture, but an idol, the God of their own making. That's sad, and it's needless. Why? Because the Son hath declared Him. If you want to know what the Lord is like, if you want to know what the living God of Scripture is like, you need look no further than His only begotten Son, Jesus. Jesus explained who the Father is and what the Father is like perfectly. Don't make a God in your own image. Don't make a God based upon your opinion, your presupposition, and your prejudices. Look on Christ. Look at Scripture. Look at the Gospels. See who Christ is, and then you'll know what the Father is like. Is that what you're doing this morning? Then I would tell you to look on the incarnation. Look on the God who showed up. Because when He did... He revealed what the Father is like, explained Him, and did so perfectly. Folks, we have hope at Christmas time. I know that Christmas is a sad time for a lot of people. But no matter what you are going through, no matter where you are in life, there is hope as we go through Christmas. Because when we cut away all of those trappings, all of those false notions that our culture has piled on top of Christmas, Christmas is about the coming of God. God in the flesh. The second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. And He came for the purpose of salvation. He came to die. You know what that means? That God cares. God cares about you. God cares about me. He's concerned about what you're going through. He knows where you are so much so that He came down into history and gave up His life so that we could be right with Him. Do you know Jesus? Do you have a relationship with Him? No relationship with Jesus. No salvation. Did you hear me? No relationship with Jesus. No salvation. He is the only way. He is the door. He is the gate. The only way to know God the Father. The only way to receive the grace of God to have your sins dealt with. Why not today? Why not look upon Christ and be saved? We're going to have a time of decision right now. And as we close our thoughts about this God who showed up, thinking about the incarnation, I ask you, if you're lost, will you come forward? Will you let me tell you more about the gospel? Will you let me share with you more about Jesus? As Brother Terry comes, as Ms. Monica plays, will you come forward and receive Jesus as the Spirit leads you? Let's stand, turn your eyes upon Jesus.